Rock The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome everybody to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bill season ticket holder Drew Gear. Notice how that beer didn't explode. Yeah, I got some new stuff. That's my producer, Chris Kruger. And it's funny because our, we got a lot to talk about tonight. A lot of it revolves around inflation, the rising costs of goods, commodities, wide receivers, and the Buffalo Bills potentially being ahead of the curve despite what a lot of fans might think and feel right now in the moment. You might have noticed over the last few podcasts there's been a lot of beer spilling all over the place. It's all over the table. It's all over me. Blue Point Brewing makes this IPA that Chris bought a six-pack of, put in this fridge, Claims he didn't shake them, but every single one of them exploded the second I opened them. You can go back and watch. Go back and watch the tape. Yeah, it exists. It's awful. A Brooklyn Summer Ale. Now that, sir, that's a great American beer. Those are like, I think I bought a 12-pack and it was like 20 bucks. Yeah, it's weird. It, beers like prices are getting out of control. It's and this is where I'm I'm starting to become like the curmudgeons like Mark Smith's of the world who just are craft beer agnostic, right? Yeah. Bush Light, High Life, you know, Miller High Life only. Because you look at this and I go, I remember a day when you could get a 30, I sound like an old man now, I'm aging myself. But I remember when you could get a 30 pack of Bush Light for about $14. Now it's about $19, which is what, a 30-pack of Miller Lite used to cost. Now that's up to about twenty four twenty five. Your craft beers have absolutely just, they've run away, right? The prices on them are astronomical. And it sucks because if you're someone like me who doesn't, like when you see the mixed packs, right? Yeah. Brooklyn mixed pack of something. There might be one beer in that thing that I like. I'm not willing to pay $22 to find out that you sold me a whole a bunch of horse piss. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not willing to do it. Also, you could just drink whiskey. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that we're talking about beer and cans because I had a debate and I actually floated a Twitter poll. Chris, if you can share that with the viewers now. If you're watching this on YouTube, what you're looking at is the results of a poll because I have a question. Who out there among you listening to this podcast right now actually take your cans back? I don't just mean like recycling them, you, you bag them up and you put them in your own recycling bin. It's being environmentally conscious and whatnot. I mean, you actually take them, you put them in a bag or back in the box, you fill shopping carts with them and you take them into a grocery store or to a, like one of those, Chris, those deposit facilities. Yes. Where they expedite the return of cans. Who's actually doing that? Now, Chris, are you a bottle and can return guy? We did that when we started doing Beer Watch for the whole season. I would, when we had Moosehead, I would save up all the Moosehead, and at you know, back then our season ended in January. Yeah, like early January. Let me still ends in January. Now it's late January, early January. I'd take all the Moosehead bottles back, and then uh, from one season of drinking all that Moosehead, I would get enough money on the bottle return. To buy one 12-pack of Moosehead. But so by and large in your own life, I know you're not much of a beer drinker anymore. You've become more of a... Bougie liquor. Now, what if I were to tell you that that might also at some point have a deposit applied to it? Would you return your liquor bottles in order to get your deposit back? No. <clears throat> what would you do with them? I'd just throw them in the trash like a real man. I like how you said, like a real man, as if it's the toughest thing you can do. Like, yeah, I build log cabins and I chuck glass into the garbage, you know, yeah. rather than recycling it. <laughs> You're an idiot. But this is because this is where it comes from. I haven't taken a, a bottle or can back in probably 10 years. They all go in the recycling. I just don't feel like taking them anywhere. And anytime anybody asks, if I throw a party and there's a bag of cans, I'm more than happy to give it away. I, we bag up our cans at the tailgates and set them aside so that the kids can take them, whoever could take them. And 
New York State has this thing now. Like they've always got a five cent deposit on their bottles and cans, but that they're they're talking about legislation where they're going to increase the deposit on your bottles and cans. They're going to increase it five cents, which on its face doesn't seem like much, but then also expand that to other bottled beverages, whether that's wine, potentially liquor, non-alcohol items. Things that are just served in bottles, point blank and period, either instituting a 10 cent deposit or increasing the existing 5 cent deposit to a 10 cent deposit. Now, we just got done talking about how everything's getting more expensive. Yeah. So what does that do to the upfront cost of a case of beer? Like the $20, let's say it's a 12 pack. Well, that's now another $1.20 you're tacking onto something that will... Yeah, no thank you. If you're the type of person that, you know, you have a rager, you know who strikes me would do this would be Bob Gutierrez. Oh, he absolutely. You have a party, and then he says, hey, just give me all your cans. He, you Why know, don't you just tell me, hey, I'm not doing well financially. <laughs> Let me have your garbage <laughs> so I can return it. <laughs> it's It really is like one of those, like, God... Uh, like when you're looking at the national, like when you look at GDP and other indicators of financial success, whether or not someone is killing themselves to not only return their own cans, but somebody else's bottles and cans, that's a red flag, right? Yes. Now, I got into a fight with Mark Smith about this the other day, and I made it a Twitter poll. Chris, what were the results of that Twitter poll? As far as who's taking them back versus who is not? Uh, let me look at it. I believe, Ma- I believe it's, uh, yeah, I... A lot of 5941. 5941. I think it's a lot. I think those results are a lot closer than most people expected. Right? Only 118 votes because no one cares. Because no one cares. This is a stupid thing to be fighting about. But he's, his stance was he doesn't care because Mark Smith loves taxes. And so my stance was okay, well, I'm not returning them. So I'm just losing. I'm losing more money every single time I'm doing this. I care. Turns out 41% of the people who took this poll, which is damn close to 50, or at least closer than I thought it was going to be, also care about the fact that this thing is becoming exorbitantly more, rapidly more expensive than it needs to be. For no other reason, because they're like, well, we need to, the deposit program and the tax that's on this and blah, 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 blah. New York State just needs more tax revenue to paper over all the other friggin' mistakes that they've made. Whether it's just stupidity or outright graft. Like, that's the problem. I don't need a new tax. I don't need to pay you another five cents on top of my bottles and cans to fix the fact that you don't know how to manage tax revenue. And that you keep losing money places. Fix that before you come get me with this stuff. So then Mark's attitude was, well, I don't care. And I go, okay, well, what happened? Because he goes, well, you'll get it back on the return. And I say, okay, we play softball together. What happens to all the beers that don't just get thrown out at the park? No one's taking those home. The empties all just get thrown into a can. And then there's a handful of individuals who ride bicycles around the park late at night and collect all the cans. I'm not seeing my return on investment there. And Mark goes, well, you're doing a civic good. That money's going. That money's going to the less fortunate. So you should consider that an act of charity. And I said, okay, guys. Go to Mark to get your money then. Whoever has to buy beer that week, go see Mark for your refund since he doesn't care about about the upside. Obviously, we're fighting about nonsense. But it really got me thinking. You know, as we're talking about things getting more expensive for no good reason, it got me thinking about the wide receiver market. Okay? The cost of everything is rising, including NFL wide receivers. And the last few days have me wondering if the Bills and the Chiefs, as it seems like at the end of most NFL seasons, are kind of ahead of the curve on everybody else in the AFC when it comes to this one specific subject. Not arrests. <laughs> Not arrests. The Chiefs are the club. They are the clubhouse leader in this. And then, of course, today there's a video of Xavier Worthy on what he made a TikTok video of himself dancing with like $5,000 in singles 
in a he's in like a crappy bathroom, like in some shitty apartment bathroom, like throwing singles on some girl while she dances, and it's like wh- what? That I didn't hear about. Oh, it's hilarious. I'm kind of glad we didn't draft him. Well, it's this idea of like guy chiefs. What are you doing? <laughs> you have you not learned anything yet? Keon Coleman <laughs> sees that and it's like, you know how many jackets you could buy with that? Do you know, that? How, many you know how many jackets I can get Yo, with man, that? Oh man, you can't be throwing them singles around like that. You know how many jackets I could get? You get them off the rack, too. You get them off season, you get them cheap. Yeah, seventy nine ninety nine. He'd be pissed. He's like, dude, it's July. You should be buying jackets with that money. <laughs> oh, I love Keon Coleman. But, so, all of this has given me a lot to think of over the last couple of days. And it started at the beginning of the week when Nico Collins signed a three-year extension with the Houston Texans. And I'll admit I was a little butthurt about it because Nico, I was bothered. Because Nico Collins at the beginning of this year, I was thinking to myself, the Bills aren't going to spend a lot of money, especially not a wide receiver. You kind of get that vibe, even though everyone's clamoring for it. They don't have a lot of cash to spend. A guy like him coming off the season he had on a bridge contract or a if you could have gotten him it would have been like it would have been one of those things where you could maybe steal a guy for a little less with the runway to a larger contract at a time when your cap situation was better instead like right at the beginning of free agency he signs a one-year deal which at the time seemed stupid given the year he just had and now gets this monster deal which it seems like that was just a placeholder Like a, hey, sign a one-year deal just so we can get you in the house, and then once we get that figured out, we'll sort out what your actual value is when the market settles. His extension is three years, $72.7 million, with $52 million guaranteed, Chris. And I want to... Do you know that $52 million in guaranteed money matches what the Dolphins gave to Tyreek Hill when they extended him after they traded for him from Kansas City? Did not know that. $52 million is a ton of money for a wide receiver a ton okay and then you start digging into the finer details of what he is like it would have made him and for a couple days it did make him number one in the nfl in terms of guaranteed at signing money among active contracts they get broken today got broken today but it comes on the heels of his first thousand yard season with eight touchdowns 2023 is the only year that Nico Collins had a catch percentage higher than 56%. It's not exactly ideal, right? No. We used to get on Dawson Knox for having frying pan hands. His catch percentage was better than 56%. So that's rough. But he's a big physical wide receiver with a lot of run after the catch ability. He can run block really well. He does a lot of things really, really well. Good lord, is that a lot of money. Especially for a team that just took on Stefan Diggs' contract and then altered it to make it a one-year, $24 million deal that Brandon Bean recently referred to as a potential albatross. And then today, Dolphins wide receiver Jalen Waddell, who was second fiddle in the Dolphins passing attack, but a really good one, he inks an extension with Miami that just comes wildly over the top of that Nico Collins deal. His extension, three years, $84.75 million with $74 million in guaranteed money. $74 million in guaranteed money. It's the most cash guaranteed at signing in the NFL right now today. Oh, you got it up here for me. Now you look at that. Now, do you see how backloaded the cap hits are, Right? Yeah. So from a cap perspective, you're looking at this going, okay, they can dump him at a certain point, right? So in it's a four-year deal that's completely backloaded with the cap hit. But at the same time, the guaranteed money is concerning, right? Because he's going to be $9 million this year. And then 19, 21, 27, and 31 over the course of the next four seasons. That's a, that's a rough one. Okay? 
but it's understandable. Unlike Collins, he's been a little bit steadier. You know, three straight thousand yard seasons, six or more touchdowns in every single season, great catch percentage, so he's got reliable hands. And he's the only pass catcher on the Miami Dolphins besides Tyreek Hill to have more than 400 yards last year. It makes sense, right? They, they have to have him. And they have a desire to keep a guy who's clearly integral to your team along with being highly reliable in the scope of your current system. Now, there's a lot of teams that if you put Jalen Waddle on that team, if with a different offensive coordinator and a different system, I don't know that he does what he's doing now. So it seems like an odd fit. I almost get the feeling like maybe they could have hardballed him a little. I don't. My thing is why why aren't you focusing on Tua? Well, is that not is Tua not the most important contract extension for the Dolphins? It's funny you say that because we have another tweet here from Elf Artiaga. Ooh, if you can throw that up there for me. Tweeted out in the aftermath of the announcement that this means that they've already agreed to the Tua structure. Waddle's extension is three years, so we now know that Tua's deal starts with very low cap charges for the first three seasons. Which I'm pretty sure anybody would have told you was going to happen. But this almost seems like confirmation of that. That they're going to backload a ton of what they're inevitably going to give to Tua Tungvaloa. So with that in mind... You add these two recent extensions to Amon St. Brown, the departure of Stephon Diggs from the Buffalo Bills, and the fact that he's now kind of locked in his money for this current season and then forced his way into free agency next year. And the ever-growing friction that exists between some of the league's number ones, your number one wide receivers, and their current teams, whether you're talking about Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Tyreek Hill, Brandon Ayuk, it just feels like there's trouble brewing at this one specific position from a roster-building perspective. Brett Coleman had an interesting take on it. He tweets out today, High-end wide receiver two now costs $28 million a year. The price of CD and Jefferson just keeps going up and up. And he followed it up with this, after getting a bunch of commentary to his original post, he followed it up with, some of you have a very different definition of what a one is than I do. If you have more on-ball snaps than Tyreek and face more press snaps than Tyreek but get half the catches and less than half the yards of Tyreek against press, you aren't a number one wide receiver. But that's okay. There are not 32 number ones in the NFL. You can be a top 32 receiver and still not be, both literally and figuratively, one of them ones. And I think it's a valid point, Chris. Makes sense. There's pr- How many wide receivers in the NFL can you name, being the lay fan, off the top of your head that a defensive coordinator might have to actually go out of his way to specifically game plan for? I'd probably put that mm-hmm. at like a five. So who are they? Just names off the top of your uh, head. I would say Justin Jefferson, Tyreek Hill, uh... Debo Samuel. That's all I can think off the top of my head. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's others. But it's not a lot. I would say around five. So that's not great news for teams who are trying to build their rosters or have unsettled have needs that aren't settled at the skill positions. And as you go through that, it raises a lot of questions about what teams are doing right now from a roster building and continuity perspective. And it's not just being questioned by fans or idiots sitting here in a basement with a glass of whiskey. Like, former NFL GM, now I want to make sure I get this right, Randy Mueller, who was the GM of the Dolphins and the Saints, he wrote an article for The Athletic that I thought was really interesting last week called, Has the NFL Wide Receiver Market Reached a Breaking Point? And this was written and published before this week's extensions were announced. I'm not going to give the entire article away, because I think you should go read it. It's, it's one of those pieces where you read it and you go, everyone should see this, it sucks, it's behind a paywall. 
just a lot, if if you're someone like me who nerds out about economics of things and just the way finances work in general, like this piece is just rife with information. Like here here's a nugget for you. Ten years ago, the highest paid wide receivers in the NFL, Larry Fitzgerald and Megatron, made sixteen million dollars a year. They were the de facto gold standard for wide receivers at the time. You could not argue that there was a better wide receiver one anywhere in football than Prime Megatron and Prime Larry Fitzgerald. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Even when guys like Julio Jones, Demarius Thomas, Des Bryant, A.J. Green, like everybody knows those names because they were highly impactful for fantasy football. They were good and highly productive players. When they signed their contract extensions, like their first big one, None of them were given market resetting deals. They all came in around 14 or 15 million on an average annual value, we'll call it. Now think about the dynamic that Brett just laid out. A wide receiver too, not an elite household name talent that everybody's banking their fantasy football team around, but a guy who's productive and he's good in the right set of circumstances and, you know, depending on who his quarterback is, now costs almost double what Megatron cost in his prime. Inflation. From 2014 to 2017, when Antonio Brown finally broke through that $16 million a year barrier when he got his first deal, no wide receiver in the NFL accounted for more than 10.4% of their team salary cap. Now you're looking at a pair of contracts that are by themselves flirting with 10% of their team's annual cap each season. And that, that Waddle figure is going to explode if the, depending on, now the team has to, it has another thing on its docket that it has to work around. If you're the Miami Dolphins, you said, I give I gave him this deal because that's what the market currently is telling me that I have to pay. Now you've inherited another tenth of your salary cap having to be worked around every single season for a player who is he the reason that you're going to win or lose most games like if you you're on spot track right now if you pull up the buffalo bills salary cap well then these are all Mm -hmm. these are all wide receivers for uh i guess this year you have top five contain two dolphin wide receivers yeah so, all right, what did you want me to pull up? If you look at the Buffalo Bills salary cap table, so if you just scroll up, that's why I love the new layout of Spotrack. Just go to teams, hover over that, and AFC East and Bills. Bang. Josh Allen's cap percentage, right, his cap hit this season is 11.8% of our salary cap. Josh Allen is the reason we're going to win or lose most football games. The Miami Dolphins have now invested more than that, a significant amount more than that, in a pair of wide receivers, one of whom is getting older and is also demanding a new contract. And again, you have these teams that are lining up to do this stuff and sign these deals for wide receiver number two talent, not the elite level of play of their predecessors who were getting the same amount of pay. I mean, to quote Pete Campbell from Mad Men, it's not great, Bob. Now, on top of that dynamic, you factor in that every single new contract, Megatron and Larry Fitzgerald held steady. Like, they paced the market for years. Now, Chris, market-setting contracts are only as good as the last one that was signed. Like, the market cap gets reset every single time a new deal gets inked. That's not sustainable. Like, every single one. Everyone, you mean to tell me every single one of these players deserves to be top of the market? And then you've considered that we're not even talking about players like Justin Jefferson or Jamar Chase. And we're not talking about what they should cost. And they will cost. Like, they're going to cost an exorbitant amount. The early estimates have C.D. Lamb. Now, the Spotrack market value thing, like, I don't know what that is worth. But when you click that and you see the number $36 million a year, average annual value, 
when you see Justin Jefferson at $32 million a year in average annual value. GMs have gotten savvier about how they manipulate contracts and how they manipulate when cap hits fall due. But $33 million, the money has to get, you have to figure that out, right? You give somebody a four-year, $134 million contract as a wide receiver. Yikes, right? Yeah. I see all of this, and I get the, like, Chris, have you, you, you hate movies, but I know you've been watching more of them recently. I haven't since whatever the last one was. Okay. Have you ever seen The Big Short or Margin Call? Never heard of them. Okay. They're very different films, and I honestly think that The Big Short is more accessible for most people. It's one in color and the other in black and white? No. One, no, one <laughs> of them is, uh, it, it would be funny to see Margin Call in black and white, to be honest. One of them is just a, like a very dramatized, here's what happened the day that a, tra- a firm in Wall Street decided to tank the market to save its own ass <laughs> and cause the 2008 economic collapse. The Big Short was kind of a goofier take on it, but a more, it explained it more. That's the one I would recommend to you because you don't understand jargon whatsoever. The Big Short was Steve Carell and Ryan Gosling. Go watch it. Yeah, your eyes lit up when I said Steve Carell. <laughs> no, no, Ryan Gosling because he's hot. So, I get, like, when I watch those movies and the anxiety that I would feel in my stomach just being somebody who understands, like, economics and is watching this all play out, I get that same feeling when I'm watching, like, the 2008 housing crisis, I think about, I think about the wide receiver market in 2024 and beyond, kind of like that housing crisis, right? We're watching money be... Like, Chris, look at the money that Jerry Judy just got paid. You want to pull up... You're on Spotrack. Pull up Jerry Judy's contract. Gabe Davis just got paid. Even if it's a three-year deal, Gabe Davis just got some cash, right? Yeah. What what are we looking at for Jerry Judy's extension? The three years, 52-5. What has Jerry Judy done besides essentially be... What? He had a couple okay seasons. A couple. He gets a $52 million deal. That seems crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. But that's what the market says you should pay. Like it, just, it just doesn't feel sustainable paying Maserati prices for an Acura. But that's what the market keeps churning out right now. I mean, that's part of the reason that Bills fans were on the, the great wide receiver train of 2024's offseason in the first place. Watching an absurd arms race take place all over the conference. Just teams falling all over themselves to throw these giant wads of cash at wide receivers so they can say that they have one. And in a lot of cases, trying to paper over some other warts, whether it's their quarterback, whether it's their offensive line, whether it's the fact that they have a crappy play caller. And just this idea that they have to keep up with the Joneses. And then you think about some of the teams that we're talking about here. The Titans. Chris, what are the Titans winning in 2024? Oh, well, I will say that that division seems winnable. Winnable to anybody. Because the Jaguars pissed it away last year. <sighs> they, they, and then, that was one of the funniest games. Yeah, the, uh, now the Texans are seem to be in the driver's seat, but, it, you know. Anything can happen. You got it. You saw him do it one year. Okay, let's see you do it again before we can really start to believe in what you're doing. So why don't you scroll down a little bit here. Okay, so their most expensive player is a pass rusher and a defensive tackle. Like, they've got players. They've got some nice pieces. But I don't see a lot of special on their team. Okay. They're paying 15% of their salary cap to a wide receiver room that gets more, I think, on historical production and name recognition than it does actual value for the 2024 season. The $28 million between Hopkins and Ridley and Tyler Boyd's getting a million dollars. The Dolphins are going to be paying about, what was it, like Hill and Waddle, 
account for forty million dollars in twenty twenty four cap space. <laughs> and this is at a time when their offensive line and their linebacker rooms are still not great. And their safety position is kind of meh. And they go, well, it doesn't matter because we we don't need pass protectors, Chris. We, we just need wide receivers. At what point does wide receivers become running backs to where you're just going to the draw? Like, all right, go find money somewhere else. I'm going to go dip my toes in the draft because I know I can get a guy in the second and third round and I got him for four years. I like that you just said that. I also like, you know who else had the same idea? Mike Florio. You know what you two have in common? You're both idiots. <laughs> I, I love you, though. Well, I mean, he is... I like you. He is a huge lib. What, what I, But that's the concept. It's like, look, this is not sustainable. And you have multiple people who are starting to look at this analytically and go, we can't... Like, we, like, Robert Mueller, more so than anybody else, I think, is qualified to speak on this because he did the job. He sat there and made poor GM decisions that eventually got him fired. So he has hindsight to rely on when he's saying, hey, guys, what the NFL is doing at wide receiver is not sustainable. It's going to blow up. And meanwhile, you look at what the Bills and Chiefs are doing right now. And admittedly, the Chiefs were ahead of the Bills in doing this. Because they tore down their wide receiver room, what, two years ago when they traded away Hill and didn't kill themselves to get a replacement? What did they They traded for Kadarius Toney. Ooh. They drafted <laughs> Sky Moore. He's rotten on my fantasy team. Yeah. That's it. Like, this is these are these are the investments they've made. This year, they've brought in Hollywood Brown and uh, Xavier Worthy, but the idea is like, look, they've been playing it relatively cheap at wide receiver at a time when everybody else is skewing the other direction. The Buffalo Bills are doing some of the same thing. Now, I'm not going to try to take the two-knee approach here and put Brandon Bean's ass directly in front of my face to just plant a, just plant a big smooch on it. I'm not doing that. When I talk about this, I need you to understand. Half the, I, I'm well aware that half the reason the Bills are in the financial situation they are, the situation that you, makes you Stephon Diggs' contract you an love albatross. It. You love it, the $54 million in, well, at a certain in to- dead cap Because at a certain you point, you it. had to. You had to do it. You couldn't sit around and piecemeal, well, we'll trim here and we'll trim some cap here. You can't. Kill the tree. Cut it all. You have to cut it down and plan a new one. And that's what they did. And I applaud him for having the balls to do it. But at the same time, let's not act like we didn't get here because of some of the decisions he made. Like continuing to sign Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde to extensions. Like taking the gamble on Von Miller. Like That's how you get to... like fifty. Over $50 million in dead money doesn't just fall from the sky. It doesn't just... You don't just trip and fall on it over the hall as you're walking out the door like it's an accident. You did this. I'm well aware of it. But with that said, at a time when a lot of AFC franchises are falling all over themselves, just to invest all of this money, I'm kind of happy we have Brandon Bean's pragmatism inside the building. Buffalo and Kansas City currently rank 25th and 29th in the NFL in cap space committed to wide receivers. Our largest cap hit is Curtis Samuel. They have Hollywood Brown. And if that's the reason they're at $22 million and the Bills are all the way down at $16 million for the whole wide receiver room. Some of that's out of necessity on both for both teams. The Chiefs have over 42% of their cap tied up in two offensive linemen, Mahomes and Kelsey. Th- that's the cost. And you know what's going to happen when Joe Tooney is finally too old to play and they get rid of him? They're going to have to pay Creed Humphrey. And he's going to cost. They're probably going to have to re-sign Trey Smith. We almost had him. He's going to cost. We almost had We almost had Creed Humphrey. God, where's Greg Thompson yeah, right now? Where, where's Greg Thompson Almost right had now? him. Hey, guys, if you're listening to this right now, I want you to just randomly tweet out. Drew, tweet at Greg Thompson. Just apropos of nothing. Drew and Creed Humphrey say hello. Just that's it. 
Or or what you do what you do is you tweet at Greg Thompson. Hey Greg, hey uh, at Greg Thompson. It's June. There's not a whole lot to talk about. Do you remember when we could have had Creed Humphrey? That was <laughs> awesome. So the Chiefs have money invest. I mean, Chris almost half their cap in four players, but they're four really critical, important players of what they're doing. Meanwhile, the Bills have $54 million in dead cap space, which is second in the NFL, just sitting on their books rotting. Now, at the same time, we've been taught, and we've seen it play out. Remember 2019? Heard Bills, of it. Bills and the Jets had all kinds of cap space, and we knew it was going to be something of an arms race to kind of see who could rebuild in the AFC the fastest, because we knew Brady's window was closing. So the Jets opted to spend all their money on skill positions and linebackers. I mean, I remember what they signed, like Mike Davis, or not Mike Davis. He's there now, right? Who's the... What year was this, 2018? Corey Davis? Corey Davis. Yeah, from the Titans, and then he retired. So, yeah, 2019. Just Google 2019 Jets free agents. So they went out and they got Le'Veon Bell. And they got C.J. Mosley, who's still there. Still there. Decently effective linebacker, but he's a middle linebacker. <laughs> there we go. See if you can scroll down here for me. It's Trevor Simeon, Le'Veon Bell, Ty Montgomery, Jameson Crowder, Josh Bellamy, Kalechi Semele, who was a big name. Tom Compton, C.J. Mosley, Brian Poole. Okay. And well, then, that's veteran additions. It didn't well, say. Well, look at the draft picks. Quinn and Williams. And that's Jacopo, it. <laughs> Jacopo Light. Nope, just Quinn and Williams, and that's it. <laughs> I guarantee you, yeah. I can I can go look at all of those other players under draft picks, and they're not in the NFL. But if you, yeah, but so if you just go and look at who they signed in free agency, because remember there was the big rumor that it was the Bills and Jets, like jockeying for, I can't remember what center it was now. And then. Didn't he go to, like, the Panthers? Yeah, and then he randomly signed with another team after the Bills, like, surprised everybody and took Mitch Morse. But that's the concept. Well, the Jets were out there signing free agents that were kind of ancillary pieces around the, the trenches and the quarterback. The Bills went out and said, you know what we need to do? We need to get Josh Allen to stand in the pocket. <laughs> we gave him the cheapest offensive line in football. It's time to right that wrong. Let's sign f- eight we're going to bring in Ty Insecki. We're going to bring in uh, Mitch Morse. We're going to bring in John Feliciano. We're going to bring in th- three guards who won't play. We just want them around just in case one of them ends up being better than the other one. We don't care. We're going to build our trenches. We're going to bring in Frank Gore. We're going to br- like they they focused on that first. Matt Paradis. That guy. There it was. Matt Paradis. So they. The Bills built from the inside out. The Jets built from the outside in. One team cratered and failed miserably, and is still doing that. One team rebuilt itself and gave its quarterback the confidence he needed to go out and better himself and make himself into one of the most ele- electrifying players in the NFL. He's like the he's like the Rock, just without ever being able to hold the belt. So, with that said, like. You look at how that works and you watch all these teams spending this money at wide receiver before they shore up things that actually matter. Everyone keeps telling us that the NFL is a passing league. And yet the best and most consistently competitive teams are still built from the inside out. You need a quality offensive line. It's, I mean, it's not done by just breaking the bank to glom skill players together and laughing all the way to the Super Bowl because this isn't the NBA. Right, Or you can just go out and stick a couple All-Stars together for a cup of coffee and go get a title. If that was the case, Jerry Jones would have bought at least three Lombardis by now. I actually saw a thing the other day, Chris. The Cowboys were in 16 of the first 30 NFC Championship games in NFL history. Ooh, half. They haven't been back in 28 years. <laughs> <laughs> Love to see it. <laughs> Fuck that guy. Uh, 
But you look at it. Look at look at where the Chiefs are investing their money. It's not in wide receivers. They're paying two stud offensive linemen, and they drafted two more stud offensive linemen. The Buffalo Bills have a lot of money tied up in tackles and guards and centers, which they've had to massage due to age, due to just cap constraints and everything else. But when you look at what the two teams have done, there's a reason they're the ones at the end of every season jockeying for jockeying for position in the AFC. But the Bills and Chiefs have developed useful tight end rooms, reliable offensive lines, and impactful running back rooms. It also doesn't hurt that their quarterbacks are probably the two best in the entire NFL. People want to talk to me about Joe Burrow. I have no time for that. Like, what was this? It's in our Twitter bookmarks. Let me see it here. I know it's in here. I can find it. Is that the the clutch narrative being driven by Fox and ESPN? Because I I think he's only got, like, one fourth quarter come from behind victory in uh, in his career. Yeah. So it's a media-driven narrative. Yeah, Joe Burrow has won one game in the NFL when the Bengals trailed in the final eight minutes. His defense has as many touchdowns in the fourth quarter of playoff games as he's led touchdown drives. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's a thing. And so you can keep telling me that Joe Burrow is better than Josh Allen. I don't want to hear any of that. Miss me with that. It's just interesting, right? Because both of these guys, Mahomes and Allen, can will their teams to wins without elite talent. I mean, think back to 2018 when we were beating teams just because Josh Allen wanted it more than them. We watched him do it to the Jaguars. We watched him do it to, I mean, I'm trying to think like there was a, I remember the Lions game when it was like a fourth and it was, it was like a fourth and three. Fourth and three, fourth and two, and they line up for it. And Pat DeMarco, I remember him saying, he's like, Josh Allen's a wild man. Because he called a huddle, and we all thought he was going to call a play. And instead he just grabbed me by the face mask and said, grab my ass and get me over the pile. <laughs> and he jumped it to end the game. Go down. There's a Detroit. There it is. The win against the Detroit Lions. Go to the box score and go all the way to the bottom, the final play. If you scroll oh. down, they have the actual play log. Oh, that's why I love pro. That's why I love pro football reference. Scroll, yeah, all the way to the bottom of the page. There we go. Scroll on. That, that. Kneels. Josh Allen up the middle for two yards. <laughs> he was just like, no, 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 no. We're doing this. They know it's coming. You grab me by the butt cheeks and make sure I get over the top of this line. And Demarco goes, "This kid's a wild man." <laughs> like that's it. And coming into 2024, knowing that they have these preeminent talents at quarterback, both the Chiefs GM and the Bills GM had the same idea. Don't chase free agent wide receivers in 2024. Don't get FOMO, right? Don't get FOMO and sign the equivalent of an adjustable rate mortgage on a marble and stucco hunk of crap right now just to say you're involved in the party. But instead, lean on the talent that's made you consistently great as a team for the last few years. Put some more pressure on your coaching staff to be better. Find more ways to win. Figure it out, right? And then go into 2025, if you're the Buffalo Bills, with no dead money on the books. And all sorts of mechanisms available to open up usable cap space. And that usable cap space is... Is really interesting to me too, Chris, when you pull up the 2025 wide receiver free agent list. I'll get on that. See, there's this idea. Take me 2019. I was just talking about all the offensive linemen we signed. We kind of went bargain shopping for skill players when we got Frank Gore, who had a great season for the Buffalo Bills. He kind of paced things while Singletary got his feet under him. And then down the stretch, Singletary, you saw him making more and more of an impact. In 2019, we went out there and paid what was, I think, below market rate for John Brown and Cole Beasley. And in the process, landed one of the best slot receivers of the NFL, in the NFL that year 
And our first thousand yard wide receiver since Stevie Johnson. Yeah. I mean, maybe there was another guy in there, but I don't remember him. It's, it was dark, you know? So given the dynamics that I just spent the last 45 minutes blathering about, I think we as fans can kind of embrace that type of approach where it's like, hey, you're going to have usable money where you can go out and find values now. Not top of the market, guys, but you can find value just like Brandon Bean did in 2019 because you're going to have the cap space to go out there and make maybe fair market contracts, but you're going to find guys who want to play with a quote-unquote winner. When you look at the list of free agent wide receivers for next year, it's crazy how much name talent exists out there. A lot of it's aged, which actually works in the Bills' favor because they're all older. Chris, look at the average age. 31, 33, 30, 29, 31, 28, 32, 32, 33, 29, 30, 33, 27. Like, this is all based on who's getting paid right now. All of these guys are going to hit the open market again next year. You're going to have names like Hollywood Brown. You're going to scroll up for me. Look at this. Chris Godwin, Amari Cooper, Keenan Allen, T. Higgins, probably, if he's not traded before the season starts this year. Brandon Cooks who just continues to be a reliable, fast, down-the-field NFL wide receiver. Deontay Johnson, who will be 29 years old. Michael Gallup, who maybe he has a bounce back. I mean, he never really came back from that knee injury, but Mike Williams. The fact that Robert Woods, he's only 33, doesn't he feel old enough to be your dad? Yeah. He feels old enough, just in the... The time that I feel like I've spent knowing his name in conjunction with football, that Robert Woods should already have an announcing gig somewhere. And then, I, do you know how depressing it is to see that he's six fucking years younger than me? Yeah, it is. He's Methuselah, and yet he's still playing in the NFL, and he's younger than me. There's just a lot here. <clears throat> there's a lot of meat on the bone, and there's going to be a lot of guys hitting the market next year. So with that in mind, it almost bodes well for you to follow this approach, right? You take a year, you take your lumps, and you figure it out. Everybody else is spending money like crazy. That More often than not, they're going to come to regret. Especially because now these are all things, like I was just talking about with the Dolphins. The Dolphins are now going to have to figure out, if they get the two extension done, you already lost Christian Wilkins, and fans are pretty concerned about what you're going to do in the defensive line. Because you've got all those injuries, you don't really have a, a name pass rusher on your roster right now. What happens if those guys don't heal? Or what happens when more injuries hit you like they always seem to? Because it's the NFL. And your offensive line isn't all that settled. And your linebacker core isn't deep or all that talented to begin with. Or this and or that. And what you've done is you you look at it and say, well, man, not only this year did I make my bed. But now going into next year, this isn't something where I can just say, okay, well, I'm going to go out next year, Chris, and do what the Bills did in 2019 and just buy every free agent offensive lineman off the market I can get. Throw all of that shit at the wall and see what sticks. No, no, no. What you're going to have to do is take a look at that Hill contract and that Waddle contract. Even if the cap hit for a two extension is low. I have to work around these three things now in order to try to fix what's already broken and holding my team back. The Buffalo Bills don't have that. The Kansas City Chiefs don't have that. And that's why, and I know this because Mark literally, Chris, the astronaut meme? Yeah, yeah. Gun to the back of the head and, oh, it's always been... The Mark, at the end of the season... Because his thing all along was, it, all season last year was, it's going to be the Chiefs and the Bills. 
Like, that's going to be it, guys. I don't care what anybody else is talking about. It's always those two teams. And when it happened and we ended up playing each other here, he got bombed and just flooded. He was tagging me in it on Facebook. He sent a copy of that meme to my LinkedIn account. (laughs) And he's right. He's right. This is why our teams are better for longer. (laughs) Even if it doesn't pay off this year, in the big picture, we're doing the smart thing. Even if it doesn't feel like it right now. And it was a sobering realization today as we were putting this together. Because I'm always accused of being a victim of the moment. Everyone's like, oh, look at this. Look at this dumb animal. He's just going to whinge and scream and thrash and... He's never going to be able to see the forest for the trees. I feel like I'm having a real moment of clarity here, and I'm happy that I can I have an outlet for that here. Hopefully you guys, some of you, especially those of you who were on the wide receiver train and think that this is lunacy what we're doing, imagine a world where Keon Coleman, who was touted as one of the raw prospects at wide receiver coming out in the draft, which is why he fell to the second round to begin with. That is his perceived lack of straight line speed. Imagine you have a year to kind of sand down the rough edges on that guy. How much better could the 2019 Bills? Chris, do you think we lose to the Houston Texans if they had a Keon Coleman on their team? Probably. Do you think that that team could have been more, much more explosive in offense? If they added a couple mid, mid-level mid veterans who did very well by that era of Buffalo Bills history standards, but then also had a guy who was, even if he's only Gabe Davis, like if that's his ceiling, has been in the NFL for a year, has refined some of his flaws and some of his weaknesses, and has had that time to acclimate where he can actually make an impact alongside those veteran free agent additions. Probably. Makes sense. Sounds like you could make a pretty nice offense around that, huh? Yeah. Especially if you have a young tight end that continues to emerge as a dominant pass catcher. And also have a running back who's pretty pretty good at making flashy plays for you. It's almost like you could very quickly reload and have this team back on its feet at the skill positions without really having to, quote-unquote, take a year off and stop being competitive. It's almost like Brandon Bean knows what he's doing. <laughs> I don't know. Obviously, there's there's a lot of time left. There's a lot of football to be played. But I, I feel pretty good about where we are in regards to what the market's saying, because I'll tell you what, Chris. Everybody who signed those... Chris, imagine all the people who bought a house <laughs> in, like, 2006. Yeah. 2007 it doesn't matter the adjust adjustable rate the cap's gonna keep going up everything's gonna be fine none of this is gonna matter yeah you can gamble on that if you want i'll take a little old school pragmatism with the opportunity to do something huge later i don't know that's just me i guess guys this has been a lot of fun and i'm happy to have been able to have this conversation with you but for tonight we gotta get the hell out of here i'm drew gear that's chris krueger this has been your rock power report